welcome and thank you for joining us today for this week's Ask the Experts workshop. I am Dr. Pamela Hurst Della Piedra, President and Founder of Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, and host of this popular Yay. weekly series. Children and Screens is a leading interdisciplinary convener, funder, and curator of scientific research and a public educator on the topic of digital media and child development. Almost 850 people have registered for today's workshop that will explore the intersection of racial justice, youth online civic engagement, media violence, and on-screen representation. Our esteemed panel of experts will discuss the nuances of talking to children about race and offer guidance to parents attempting to wrangle the complexities of social justice and digital media. Of course, racial injustice cannot be summarized nor solved with a 90-minute webinar. However, we hope that the lived experience and advice of our panelists will inspire you to initiate these vital conversations within your family and beyond. Further, we acknowledge that race, representation, and justice intersect with myriad topics under the purview of children and screens, and we are committed to exploring the, this, inter, this intersectionality in future webinars, which is to say, this is just the beginning of a vast conversation. Our panelists have reviewed the questions you submitted and will answer as many as possible during and after their presentations. If you have additional questions during the workshop, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and indicate whether or not you would like to ask your question live on camera or if you would prefer that the moderator read your question. Please know that we may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we'll answer as many as time permits. We are recording today's workshop and hope to upload a video onto YouTube in the coming days. Tomorrow, you'll receive a link to our YouTube channel where you will find videos of our, from our past webinars as well. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Dominic Rollins. Dominic is the Di Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Dalton School in New York City. In this role, he provides leadership and oversight to develop a comprehensive diversity and equity and inclusion strategy. Dominic regularly uh, collaborates with teachers and academic leaders to institute a culturally relevant equity pedagogy in classrooms and serves as mentor to faculty, staff, students, and parents on issues of social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. Welcome, Dominic. Thanks so much, Pam. Hello, folks, and welcome to the webinar today. We're really excited to have you. Um, we have some esteemed folks that will share insights in their expertise, um, trying to ground things in practical language, how to, to really offer up advice, um, guidance for our parents. One of the things that I want to be really clear about as we sort of embark on our time together is that we are in a really historical moment. Um, a moment and movement that we have been in time before, but haven't felt it this way. Um, haven't felt the pressing need for racial justice in this way. And at a time where a lot of our conversations are about race and racism, um, it is a time where we also need to center um, the voices of Black folk, the voices of uh, people of color, the voices of folks who not only have the expertise, uh, but also the lived experiences to help us move through uh, this moment. Um, and so as we are here today, uh, you will notice um, with great intention uh, that our panel is all folks that are Black with really great and incredible expertise uh, that will be helpful and a value add to our time together today. The way that we will flow um, is that each panelist will provide some information uh, about a five minute or so sort of presentation. Uh, and then I, along with that panelist, will engage in a light Q&A, a little bit of a conversation, maybe unpacking an idea or two from what they share. With each of our panelists, uh, we aim to have 20, 25 minutes or so left for Q&A uh, from you all. And each of you may have submitted a question. We will try to get to as many of them as possible. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first panelist. 
Dr. Valerie Adams Bass is an assistant professor of education at the University of Virginia, where she examines the relationships of racial socialization and racial identity with the developmental processes, social and academic outcomes of black children and youth. As an applied researcher, she's conducted research with urban African American and Latin adolescents and South African youth and facilitated training with adults and youth on college preparation, science, civic engagement, and life skills curriculum and activities. With that, I'll turn it to Dr. Adams Bass to share, um, and then we will engage a little bit. Thanks so much, Dominic, and thank you and welcome to everyone who's joining us today for this very important panel. Um, I'm excited to be here and share a little bit of my knowledge and conversation with you. Um, and just thinking about contextualizing my colleagues who will be here and, and share with us today, uh, two elements uh, that are relevant and important to this discussion are both racial socialization and racial identity. Um, those are two important elements of identity processes for all children, but specifically for children of Black descent who are Black um, of the diaspora. And so in layman's terms, thinking about racial socialization, we want to think of it as a process um, that parents employ for preparing their children, particularly Black children, with um, managing and navigating a world where people are probably going to respond to them, highly likely to respond to them because of the color of their skin. It includes modeling behaviors, it includes conversations, it, it, and sometimes, in some cases, what you may see today includes some level of, of role playing. What do you do when someone responds to you based on how you look, your ethnic and racial identity, more than who you are as a whole person? Um, children begin to receive racial socializations immediately at home in the home environment. And then the second environment that we know it occurs in quite frequently is the school environment. That's when children traditionally spend most of their times outside of the home. So Black parents, particularly in the United States, have are tasked with figuring out how do you preserve the identity, provide opportunities for your children to thrive, knowing that it's likely people are going to respond to them because of the color of their skin. And Black children, whether they're adolescents or early childhood preschoolers, come in all colors of brown, shades of brown, very yellow to very dark. Um, but in all cases, there's that response. So what do we do or what do you do as a parent to help your child respond and prepare to that? There are different forms of racial socialization. Some of them are proactive and sort of acknowledging this is going to happen with your children. And then there are other forms where we take a wait and see approach. I would also add, while this panel is focused on Black children and families, that all parents engage in racial socialization. And the research of others indicates that for white parents, oftentimes it's more of a, a colorblind approach to racial socialization. So when those racial encounters occur, um, children and, and their parents often don't know how to respond to racialized images that we see in the media. They don't know how to re respond to racialized encounters that happen in the classroom or sometimes in social spaces. And that sort of perspective can contribute to what we consider uh, microaggressions, right? So Dr. Sue has done a lot of work on that, Daryl Wing Sue, on microaggressions and what that looks like. And there certainly is a relationship between a colorblind approach to racial socialization and microaggressions that are expressed against or towards Black children, families, and youth. So I do want to share that. And in sharing that, I also want us to think about media images. Right now, as Dominic mentioned, we are living in a time where we have been sheltering in place. We're experiencing a humanitarian crisis, this pandemic, which for months had, has had us all at home. So our gaze, if you will, has been connected to media, both fictional and non-fictional media. Social media has played a relevant part in how we are gaining and resourcing our information, particularly for young people. Those of us who are more mature are likely to watch the evening news or listen to a news station or broadcast. Um, but children, particularly adolescents, are more likely to go to their Twitter feed to see what people are talking about on TikTok, to share with one another, not so much on Facebook, but in these other social spaces to form groups on GroupMe to talk about what's happening and maybe to take snatches of media from what we consider mainstream media. So what we need to know and what we need to think about is this definition of, we need to think about a definition of racial, of media socialization, should I say, when we're thinking about media as a socializing agent. Media certainly is a socializing agent. 
that um, plays a part in how young people come to understand who they are and how people respond to them. So we want to be able to ensure that we are helping them to digest and understand the media as it comes to them. So my definition, the definition that I use um, in thinking about media socialization is really um, we're thinking about racial socialization. We're also thinking about media socialization. So what we're thinking about in this case is the exposure to mass communication, whether it's television, radio, internet, newspapers, a, a dying breed, if you will, e-zines, magazines like Teen Vogue, really teach accepted behavior. They have direct influence in spite of what we might perceive or believe. And they really facilitate and play in, 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 in a they parallel or they complement and sometimes don't the racial socialization messages that adolescents and children are receiving, as well as help them to understand or to question their own racial identity. So we want to think about media as a socializing agent and that children are learning and responding to what they see on television. So as parents, part of our responsibility is to equip them with messages that help them to digest as well as in, to interpret media images, particularly if they are racialized, um, if they are uh, really promulgating stereotypes about black people, whether black children or adults, as well as if we're seeing, if they're seeing repeated images of violence of black people, how do we provide them with racial socialization messages that allow them to cope, to digest, and also to preserve their humanity because Black children are children, whether they're teenagers or toddlers, they're children. And we want to ensure that we too are thinking about the media that they're being exposed to and the messages we provide them to as their primary socializing agent so that they're able to filter those messages in a way that's supportive and protective of their own identities. Dr. Adams Bass, thank you. I, as we think about this, and I'm, as I'm listening, uh, I have to imagine that there are some parents, families who are, who are saying, I've never really thought about um, curating or doing differently sort of the messages that my child is receiving, right? That, that world of theirs is like their own little world, whether it's the TV or the media. Um, what would you say is a, is a first step? Like if, if for a moment we believe that this information as media socialization is new to some families, what's a first step? Sure, I think that's a great question, Dominic. And a first step is to watch the media that your children are watching and when they're young to curate that media that you're exposing your children to. So we're talking about visual media, televised motion media, but we also want to think about the books that we bring into our house, the images that adorn our walls. We want to think about all of those spaces where children are going to see with their eyes um, and make sure that they are diverse representations. I think oftentimes for parents, we uh, model what we've experienced and if we have grown up in a house hold or live in the community where uh, contributions of Black people have not been valued, then we don't really think about ensuring that the books, the dolls, the pictures, the posters, the scientists that we share, the museums that we take our children to are inclusive of Black people and Black culture. So a first step is taking, I would say, taking a census of your home. What is in your home? What's on the bookshelves of your children? That to me is a first step in expanding the conversation and providing a normalcy to alternative images that are more positive and inclusive of Black people and Black culture. I, I appreciate that so much. And I think it, it takes something that is often taken for granted, um, brings it out of the background and puts it into the foreground. Um, not a lot of folks are, are often thinking about that. And I'm wondering, as we um, move here in a moment, if you could speak on what does that mean across different races and ethnicities? Sure. I imagine that possibly Black families have an attunement to this because of living in a world where the media representation doesn't favor them. But if I'm not Black, if I'm a white person, if I'm a person of a different race or ethnicity, Am I thinking about it in the same way? Um, probably not. Uh, and I would say a, a couple things. So 
One of the things that I would say is that uh, the research sort of supports uh, both my research as well as the research of others and some who are on this panel that uh, Black families and children tend to watch television for quote unquote entertainment purposes, whereas non-Black families tend to watch television for um, for news, for information, to learn that socialization process. So if you have limited actual lived experience encounters with Black people or Black children, only one or two, maybe three or four of them live in your community, the probability that you're going to understand the cultural distinctions and differences is low. But one of your responsibilities is when you're combing through the bookshelves, um, not to just purchase Jack and Jill, right, but to purchase um, Jack and Jill early readers um, and being facetious, but there are other books. Um, even if we think about Charlie Brown, you know, having a character in Charlie Brown that's, that's Black, you know, so making sure that, that those books, those stories that you bring home um, include characters are, that are not all white. And um, so you have to make an effort to do that. Um, white is normalized as in and idealized, and in some communities where it's homo relatively racially homogenous, it is an afterthought to think about being inclusive. So as parents, your role is to look for those books, look for those storylines that are more inclusive, including storylines and movies that are for an older or mature audience, and then to watch with your children and have discussions with your children about that. Um, when you're going to museums, if you're going to a mainstream museum, are you also paying attention to the art by non-white artists? Are you having conversations about the historical contributions, not just the things that are absent from the history book, but being additive in those conversations, additive in what's happening in your home? So those things are relevant and important. Are you following the conversations that young people are having in social media spaces so that you can enter that conversation? Um, so knowing the alternative perspective and points of view is relevant for having that discussion with your child when they come home and say, you know, I saw students in my school wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. What's that all about? Right. So understanding that legacy, how that's related. And if you've already been doing some research and, and expanding your own world beyond what's normal for you, then it's an easier conversation. If you haven't been doing that work already, now is the time to dig into the history. I wouldn't necessarily say history books because so much of the history is missing unfortunately, but going to the Smithsonian African American History Museum. There are local museums in almost every major, major state. And right now, virtually, lots of museums are, are being inclusive of that culture. So you want to make sure that you're doing that. You can go online. So you have to do some learning yourself if you haven't been doing this work. Well, and part of that learning is disrupting the, the dominant narrative and the norm and sort of what, we, um, what we've inherited. Sure. And lots of my students, I teach a class on media representations and Black adolescent identity, and lots of my students love This Is Us, which is this multiracial story, which includes a Black main character, right? So what is it like to live in a multiracial, biracial family? What's his experience like compared to his white parents and his white uh, brother and sister. And so the complexities of identity in America are really explored in a television show. That's a space, that right there is a space to try to start to grapple with the reality that many Black families and Black people experience in this country and in this context. So, you know, again, if you're not sure where to go for the non-fictive work, there are few spaces right now in media where you can go for the fictional work to say, wow, there's some, this seems like this might be more realistic than the comedic representations of Black people. Perhaps I need to learn a little bit more. I'm going to move us, thank you, to be continued in our Q&A. Um, appreciate it. All right. Next, we will hear from Dr. Howard Stevenson, who is the Constance Clayton Professor of Urban Education and Professor of Africana Studies and Human Development and Quantitative Methods Division of the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, an esteemed professor. <laughs> He's also the executive director of the Racial Empowerment Collective at Penn, designed to promote racial literacy in education, health, community, and justice institutions. With that, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Howard Stevenson. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, I'm assuming you all can see this. I just want to talk for a very brief set of minutes around why preparing children for racism can reduce racial stress and trauma. Um, and I want to start with a 
a proverb that we use in our work. Uh, the lion's story will never be known as long as a hunter is the one to tell it. Um, I grew up in my family um, in awe of my mother, who uh, my brother and sister and I also in awe would watch her uh, mow down disrespect for white people in the supermarket when they were not treating us right. And my mother gave us many talks, uh, we could argue, about how to navigate the world around race. But the one she gave us before going into the supermarket sounded something like this. Don't ask for nothing. Don't touch nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? She would walk away and she'd come back. And we knew she was coming back because she wasn't finished. She would say, I don't care how many other kids are climbing the walls in that supermarket. They're not my children. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And we would all say in three-part harmony, yes, mom. And when we think about that, the talk that so many people think about, which is wonderfully what, what Dr. Adams Bass was just describing, is, is, is racial socialization. For us, that talk meant a lot because she gave it to us over and over and over again. And we saw our mother as our racial superhero because of how she navigated these public thoroughfares back and forth. Our father was sort of like a spiritual superhero but our mother was a racial superhero. And three lessons we got from her interactions, watching her uh, and practicing ourselves on how to manage racial moments. One of those lessons was that predominantly white spaces could be war zones. That is, they could be times in which we all might find ourselves needing to defend, protect uh, from particular types of harm. The second lesson was it's okay to resist and fight back that dehumanization. And the third lesson, uh, lesson was that racism is not our problem, but their problem. Now, I can tell you, as much as we went on watching my mother do that work, we were also stressed because we were worried that something might happen to her through retaliation or whatever. So it was both powerful and stressful. And one of the ways that I think about the way that racism has affected our society is that we know um, more than ever that racial hate is increasing. Um, around the country, um, and it has been doing so for a very long time, and particularly in places where children find themselves spending most of their time in schools. And educators have reported being very unprepared for this, these sets of moments. The stress that comes from racial experiences, we know a lot more now uh, through um, Shelley Harrell's definition out of Pepperdine, uh, is that when we're overtaxed, the kind of basic definition of racial stress is being threatened by racial moments that could come out of anywhere. And in many respects, racial trauma is sort of a prolonged or intense exposure to that. In some of our research, we've also noticed that parenting stress, uh, the stress of being a parent is very different than the stress of being a parent of black and brown children, where you're worried daily that something might happen to them because of the color of their skin or how people will respond to that or overreact to it. We also know research suggests that racial stress and trauma are linked to a host of particular issues that face children every day. Hostile relationships with professionals, the humanizing climates where you just feel like, man, I don't belong here. Uh, what's amazing in the great work by William Darity and uh, Mullen in the recent book on um, From Here to Equality on on reparations is this incredible data to support the notion that this racism has affected us across generation and wealth, generations in health, wealth, housing, and education outcomes. And finally, uh, one argument for why talking to our children about race uh, is that what if you knew that our children's inability to navigate the racial world is also linked to poor cardiovascular health, inflammation, sleep quality, and even breathing. And I say to parents, would you be interested in having that conversation if you knew that was going to be uh, one of the outcomes you could change? So as Dr. Adams Bass has done so well in describing what racial socialization is, uh, the how is about how our, our children can watch us all the time being both verbal and nonverbal. Sometimes the most powerful communication we give about race is what we don't say. And in many respects, in addition to social media, parents, teachers, classmates, schools can be the who that deliver it. But the why is kind of the question that I'd like to focus on. And four things come to mind. To affirm humanity of our children, to protect them from harm, 
to redirect any self-destructive thinking or internalizing of those negative stereotypes, and finally to connect them to thriving relationships. The reality is legal approaches, as much as they are important in our society, will not heal the daily racial trauma that our children and we are exposed to. And one of the questions is, can talking to children about race actually help us heal racial stress and trauma? And I believe that it can. If you look at some of the research on racial socialization, and this is a lot of stuff, the benefits have, have um, shown that uh, the more we talk about race to kids, we see benefits around uh, preschoolers and cognitive behavioral competence. Others have found academic achievement, racial identity has been mentioned already, and a greater appreciation of our own history and culture. But in some of the interventions work, we also know it can be very important in, in helping young people manage anxiety, anger, and depression manage, management, as well as reducing uh, racial stress in, during racial conflicts. So the question is, why is it so protective? And what we've learned is, in talking to children about race, children pretty much respond to these racial encounters as if they're less stressful because what? I've been prepared for this. I've seen this before. This is not the first time. And over time, we build a confidence in, in not avoiding those moments, but engaging them. And in many respects, what, what we're working on now um, beyond racial socialization is racial socialization is about preparation. Racial literacy is about boot camp. It's like going uber preparation, where the ability to read, recast, and resolve racially stressful encounters is the focus. And, and reading, recasting, and resolving racial literacy skills is about how much we notice about our bodies and emotions during those moments, how well we interpret those moments accurately. Do we see the racial elephants in the room? Are we able to reduce our stress so that we can think straight through recasting? And to what degree we're able to walk away making healthy decisions that are not an over or under reaction to the moment and that match our social justice values. And the last thing I'll say, we use a mindfulness approach to help young people and parents navigate these moments by calculating what feelings am I having and how intense those feelings are in the racial moment, locating where in my body do I feel those things because our body keeps the score of that stress and trauma, and then communicate, which is how much am I saying to myself through my self-talk and through memories during the moment that can give me clues as to what's really going on with breathing slowly, four counts in, and exhaling out six counts even slower, giving me the chance to bring oxygen to my brain so I can see and make decisions more clearly. And I will say, yes, talking to children about race, I believe can help us navigate the politics of racial stress and trauma, but it starts with our own story. Thank you. Chock full, Dr. Stevenson. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, you drew me into a memory that I have of growing up where my mother told me I had to work twice as hard as the white man sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that my mother had the language of racial stress, um, but she had the lived experience of racism to know that she needed to prepare me and prepare mm -hmm. my work ethic in the world as I encountered whiteness, particularly as someone growing up in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I bring that story in to ask you just one question for this segment, which is, how important is the language or terminology for parents, particularly parents of color, particularly black parents in, in moving through this with a kid? I think there's an intuition for this. And mm -hmm. I can also imagine black families tuning in right now saying, that's a lot and not necessarily how I think about it, though I understand the value of the conversation. So sure. how important is that? Is that language and it's some of it's evolving in, in, in the research currently. Yes, I think um, we have as researchers focus a lot on what exactly parents do say, but I think in, in, in talking to your child, if you can remember that children are picking up also on your nonverbal uh, movements, um, that you're also communicating that. And, and one thing I would say to parents is, are you aware of what you're communicating no matter what language you use, right? Some of us will try to be hopeful with our children and children know they're scared of something. And I think in some respects, you know, talking about what's going on with you, mommy and daddy is scared that I, you know, and, and sad that I even have to tell you that you have to work twice as hard. Uh, to be equal to everyone else. And then children are getting the full picture of what you're absolutely saying. You are afraid for them. 
you're not sure what the world's going to do, but you're giving them something that will make them feel as if, you know, all things are possible. And I would say the language is important, but it's secondary to the actual emotional communication that children get from us. I, I, I think that is spot on um, and uh, appreciate. Um, I think the essence is tell your kids why. Mm -hmm. uh, why would I be unpacking this with you? Why would I be naming this? Um, and that sometimes fall in this tense place of wanting to protect folks from, but we know that we can't protect folks of color and black folk from the racism that is in the world. Like you will sort of experience it, um, whether it's observing it or it being direct. And so if I can tell you why I am responding in the way and why I need you to respond in that particular way, I'm doing mm -hmm. a little bit more for you there. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm gonna move us to our next panel, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we will hear from Dr. Jackie Duget, who's a pediatrician, writer, and speaker. She's also the host and creator of the podcast, What is Black? And the author of a middle grade novel, Learning to Love All of Me. Dr. Duget, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dominic. So I'm gonna share my screen as well. So hello everybody, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with you to talk about this important topic. So I'm gonna talk about how to talk to children about race and violence in the news. Once I get my technical skills. All right, so I'll go back to the first slide. So I, as um, Dominic mentioned, I'm the co-author of the American Academy Pediatric Statement on racism and its impact on children and health. And as both our uh, prior panelists have discussed, um, racism has health, health consequences. And my colleague, who's the lead author of the policy statement, Dr. Maria Trent, um, is quoted as saying, racism is a socially transmitted disease. It's taught and it's passed down. So my role as a pediatrician is really to help parents navigate why it's important to have these conversations about race, because it is a matter of our health and well-being and our social and emotional well-being. So I want to put it in context of development. Um, so children learn about racial bias very early, um, as early as six months and probably as young as three months old. They can notice race-based differences. They don't ascribe um, negative um, values to that. They just notice differences. Um, by the time they're two to four, children can start to internalize those racial biases. By age five, children of color um, can start to internalize those existing stereotypes of their racial groups. And by age 12, many children have, have fixed ideas about race and bias associated with race. So there are opportunities here for as parents to really intervene early to um, prevent some of the, um, the health outcomes and the social outcomes of racism. So I wanna talk a little bit about strategies to help um, children deal with racial bias. As discussed earlier, it is important to talk to children and acknowledge that racial biases and differences exist. Talking about race is not racist, all right? Also, we wanna make sure that we confront our own biases. We wanna know where we stand before we talk to our children. So we, need, so we need to check our perceptions and thoughts about other people so that we can model for them the behavior that we want them to see. And then we also wanna encourage our children to stand up and stand against um, racial stereotypes and racial bias. And I also put this in the context of um, anti-bullying discussions, right? So when we talk about, we want our kids to be kind and compassionate, we want them to be kind and compassionate to everyone, right? Whether, regard, irregardless of their race, creed, religion, sexual orientation, all, all, all shapes and forms of identity. But it starts early. And that what we're teaching them now really does make an impact on how we address racism. So how can parents confront their racial bias? So you wanna be a, be a role model by acknowledging your thoughts and correcting um, your thoughts and ideas. Um, I also suggest having a wide, culturally di diverse social network, a social, um, social network. Many of us do live in homogenous communities and may not have the opportunity to see other people. So as Dr. Bass mentioned, there are wonderful opportunities to do this, going to museums, through books, through, um, through theater, through um, multiple forms of media. We also wanna travel and expose our children to other communities and also get involved 
um, in our places of worship, politics, our children's schools, so that we can advocate for um, fair treatment for all. So tips for talking about racial differences. Again, I wanna reiterate that talking about race is not racist. It's okay and important. Um, we know from, um, especially what Dr. Bass was saying, colorblind um, methodologies or education does not work. Um, and it has not worked since, hence we still have the problem of racism. So how we talk to kids is gonna differ based on their ages. So for preschoolers, I think it's important again that we, we with, when kids, kids see difference that we acknowledge it and we also talk to them about, um, is, you know, we bring up things like, reaffirming that yes there is difference but isn't aren't they beautiful you know even though they're different what are, what are the similarities so that we can create um an understanding that we have a shared humanity for grade schoolers those conversations will get a little bit more in depth and you can talk talk more specifically about racial bias in media and books um, and then for teens and tweens again those conversations definitely get more complex having been being a parent of two teenagers adolescents they have gotten more complex. But this is also a great time to encourage um, activism, right? So that our kids don't feel helpless, there's something that we can do about it. And I put this slide in just to reiterate that our kids are hearing about racism everywhere, from protests to social media, to television shows that are, that are meant to educate through the just different forms of media. So our kids are hearing about it even though we may not be aware that they are or acknowledge that they are. So how can we help children understand what's going on in the media regarding race and racism and, and violence? When we wanna check in with our children, are, how, are, how, are they, how are they taking in things, right? Asking them questions. So how are you feeling about this? Um, what are you watching, right? And just engaging questions and even giving them space for them to come and talk with you so that you don't have to force the conversation. Sometimes things you find out are in those quiet moments when you're in the car with them. You want to watch for changes in your child's behavior. They may become, you know, we want to look for signs of uh, stress responses, anxiety, depression, right? Are they becoming more withdrawn? Are they acting out? Are you know, just, just differences. As a parent, you're gonna notice if your child is different, especially being home, quarantined, you're getting to know your children much more. Also, this is very important. We wanna limit what our children see in the media. It's important that they know about it, but it doesn't have to be all, all day, all the time. Because even as a parent, this is stressful information, right? So we wanna also spend time together. Be aware of your own emotions, because again, as a parent, even as a pediatrician, watching the constant protests, the videos. I'm stressed out. I've had insomnia. So I need, to, I need to check in with myself as a parent as well as my kids because my kids are also going to react to my emotional um, flows. And also, despite all the negativity, there is positivity. This can be used as a teachable moment. The protests, also putting things in a historical context for kids that we have overcome, right? There's a history of social, um, social um, civic engagement, nonviolent protests that have led to change. And it's been led by, and it's not only people of color who've led this change, there are other communities as well. So we're in this together. And then also resources are very helpful if you really don't know where, what to do or where to go. And I, in the next slide, I'm gonna share a few resources. So here are just a few, and the slides will be available. Um, there are a few um, articles from healthychildren.org, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, resources from Common Sense Media on finding books with diverse characters, finding apps and games with diverse characters, uh, from tolerance.org, um, A Parent's Guide to Preventing and Responding to Prejudice, um, and also some additional resources uh, from Embrace Race about additional books to help support conversations of race, racism, and resistance. So in summary, talking about race isn't racist. Children learn about racial differences and biases very early. And we have an opportunity um, to teach our kids because our children of almost every age are hearing and watching what is happening in our nation. And parents as children's first teachers can help their children deal with, um, deal with, these, um, with racial, racial differences and, and um, racism.
And then just a plug, as Dominic said, my new middle grade book, Learning to Love All of Me. So thank you very much. I look forward to the um, Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, before we move to our last panelist, I, I was struck um, that your, your comments address all parents. Um, and I imagine um, that parents are sort of receiving that information a little differently, um, depending on their race and probably depending on their other social identities. Um, I want to ask, what would you say specifically to white folk, to white parents, what they can do? Um, because I think some of the onus regarding teaching about racial bias um, is or needs to be shouldered by white folk differently um, than people of color. Um, and sometimes I think white folk know that and may want to hear. Um, so I'm curious. Um, I might be projecting a little bit from my own vantage point, but I'm, I'm curious on, on what might you say specifically that white parents um, would be doing or if you were to go deeper. Yeah, there. Oh, so that's a good question. So I think, I think in terms of going deeper, I think one acknowledging, right? Are you, are you at the table with this discussion, right? So understanding of, do you get Black Lives Matter? Do you understand why this movement is occurring? So kind of, again, there's that check-in. Yep. And if you're on board and, you, and you're at the point where, well, I just don't know what to do, that's the first step. I think the first step is the buy-in, right? You have to understand why this movement is important, why this movement needs to, needs to evolve and needs to be worked on and solved systematically, right? And also understanding that when we talk about racism, it's not just an individual, you're racist, I'm racist, right? Pointing out who, you know, pointing fingers. It's really a system, a system, you know, that is political, educational, um, criminal justice system. So I think first you have to be at the table and be willing to acknowledge that, yes, there's a problem and willing to try to do the work to figure out how to solve that problem. Because I think really as parents, we have to, we really, we're gonna have to do some homework, right? Mm -hmm. And really have to do the work and be open for our kids to lead the conversation. Because for many of us that are not, are not there yet, our children are very much aware and very much wanting to have us do something about it. So sometimes you may have to take a step back and, and learn from your kids. Because I, I like it also to talk about, you know, car seats or smoking. A lot of times our kids are the ones that tell us, mom, dad, you need to put your seatbelt on, right? You need to stop smoking. So in this way, so I think, so hopefully that's helpful. No, I think- I, think I have to acknowledge it, yeah. Um, and I think one of the things you draw out is a, a, a level of work that parents have to do, them specific, specifically white parents have to do that you may not thought that you needed to do. And that's bringing awareness and knowledge to the, the issues so that you can better inform your own kids, um, be more mindful of how they're engaging and, and speak um, with authority about some of these issues, um, which not everybody may have thought that they needed to, to do. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm excited for a little bit more in the Q&A, uh, but before we can get to the full Q&A, we gotta hear from Dr. Craig Watson. So, Dr. Craig Watkins is the incoming Ernest Sharp Centennial Professor at the University of Texas at Austin. An internationally recognized expert in media, Watkins is the author of five books exploring young people's engagement with media and technology. His two most recent books, The Digital Age and Don't Knock the Hustle, result from his work with the Connected Learning Research Network, a research collaborative funded by the MacArthur Foundation. With that, Dr. Watkins, take it away. Thank you, Dominic. And uh, thank you to the uh, prior panelists uh, for your uh, great observations uh, and insights. I'm going to share my screen with you. So let me pull up uh, slides. Okay. So um, much of what we've heard uh, to this point, uh, and I uh, agree with everything that's, that's been noted here. Uh, and in particular, um, you know, I, I, I found it really compelling, uh, the points made about um, what was referred to as media socialization. Uh, and that is the extent to which media becomes a resource that, 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 that socializes, that trains, that educates or miseducates 
um, how the public oftentimes uh, perceives and understands um, this racial justice conversation uh, that our nation and in, indeed the world uh, finds itself having uh, today uh, as a result of uh, very recent circumstances. What I thought I would do today is, is focus uh, my comments primarily around um, children, uh, preteens and teens and their relationship to the, the, the most dominant force of media in their lives, uh, and that is uh, social media, uh, and the role that social media uh, is playing uh, in terms of shaping um, our uh, current conversation around racial justice. So one of the things that we um, have, have come to understand in the research literature, and parents and, and likely teachers and educators, you, know, you don't need social scientists or other researchers to tell you this, is that most children, preteens, and teens are getting their news and information almost exclusively from social media platforms. Um, and so uh, this is a, a fundamental sort of generational shift from how we've thought about uh, the ways in which news and information circulate, particularly right as it relates to social issues, public affairs related kinds of issues, historically newspapers, um, television, cable, broadcast news, being the primary disseminators, the primary sort of shapers of what we might call the sort of agenda setting function that kind of sets the tone for what we understand, pay attention to, and, and discuss in our homes and elsewhere. Social media is really driving that agenda now. Social media is, is in many ways shaping that conversation. And so it's certainly shaping the ways in which young people are being exposed to different ideas, perspectives, uh, as it relates to racial justice. So this is just, uh, I wanted to share with you just a couple of um, interesting uh, findings from Common Sense Media. And this is a report that you can find on their website. Um, and it basically sort of reiterates um, what, what I've referred to here, what I've noted and what other panelists have noted as well. 77% um, of uh, teens get their news and information headlines from social media. Another 28% say that they uh, actually, their preferred news source is a personality, influencer, or celebrity on social media, let's say, for example, via, via YouTube. And I'll talk here in a moment about uh, the sort of emergence of influencers, particularly social media driven influencers, and what that means uh, for your children and the kinds of things that they're being exposed to in terms of conversations around race and racial justice. Um, the top two platforms, uh, YouTube and Inst Instagram, for where kids are getting uh, their news and information from. And again, right, this is, this is, this is literally a, a fundamental shift in terms of the channels, the platforms, the news and information sources that children, preteens and teens are now accessing to sort of engage uh, issues around race, to engage issues around um, social uh, justice, for example. Um, and here, um, you know, I thought that, that this is particularly interesting as well. Um, you know, when Common Sense asked them about, uh, you know, the most commonly mentioned personalities that they trust, uh, here are some of the, the, the sort of top uh, leading uh, contenders that emerged in their study. PewDiePie, for those of you who don't know, is a popular YouTuber. Trevor Noah, uh, a, a late night um, television, uh, late night show television host. Um, uh, Donald Trump and Beyonce speak uh, for themselves. So, so there are a lot of uh, sort of implications in terms of young people's sort of deep investment in social media and the way in which social media has become implicated in virtually every aspect of their lives, including the kinds of conversations that they're having around uh, race and social justice, including how they're beginning to consume information related to race and social justice. So just you know, a, a, a couple of pros. Um, you, you could argue right, that as a result of the channels that they're connected to, the platforms that they use, the devices that they own, we know that kids at younger and younger ages are more and more likely to own their own sort of mobile device, their own smartphone, for example. So they're just simply being exposed to more information, right? notifications, alerts, um, via their, their social contacts and networks, that information now finds them, as opposed to them having to seek out information. Um, and what this means, right, is that um, for a lot of young people this summer, right, as a result of their connection to social media and their peers via social media, they were exposed to conversations, they were exposed to concerns uh, about racial justice in a way that no other generation of children have been exposed to. They saw things, if it was, uh, you know, videos that were captured and, and shown across um, TV screens and social media screens, um, just simply being exposed to more. And what you could argue, right, is that this, this enhanced exposure to news and information at least begins to open up the opportunity uh, for young people to begin to start cultivating what we might call the civic self 
that is their own kind of identity, their own voice and their own perspective in this conversation around race and social justice. And part of the, the research over the years is, is trying to understand the ways in which uh, young people develop voice, develop identity, and develop agency, and how we can support that. And as many of our panelists have noted here, kids start developing this awareness. Kids start developing these ideas and identities at extraordinarily young ages. Uh, and so part of what we're suggesting here, right, is, is how is social media influencing their identity development and social awareness? There are, of course, right, enormous uh, implications in terms of some of the cons associated with this sort of greater exposure to news and information via the social channels that they are connected to. Um, the, the one that I think is probably the most significant uh, is just the proliferation of disinformation and misinformation. And that is to say the degree to which we are all, and certainly uh, our kids, are being, via social media, are being exposed to campaigns that are deliberately designed to misinform, deliberately designed to provoke um, polarization and, and antagonism. And so one of the things we have to do as a culture, as families and as educators, is begin to start equipping um, our young people with the tools and the resources to be able to discern uh, and better protect themselves against these kinds of deliberate attempts to use these channels now uh, to really sort of um, uh, intervene and, and bring um, sort of um, frustration and anger uh, and again polarization uh, to our uh, civic culture. One of the things that Common Sense did is they, and, and they had reached out to me, I think, um, we, we did a similar study looking primarily at 18 to, to 34 year olders, 34 year olds in terms of their relationship to social media and their engagement with political issues, social issues, civic issues. Uh, and one of the questions that we were interested in, right, is given that young people are increasingly exposed to racial and social justice issues via social media, how do they feel about the content that they're being exposed to? And Common Sense asked if they could use a similar question to ask uh, you know, teens uh, about uh, this as well. And here's what they found, right, is that, that, that you know, a sizable number of teens express negative feelings in terms of the content that they're being exposed to. Frustration, confusion, being worn out by this. And this is significant, right, to parents. This is significant to educators and for those who, who, who care about young people, that even as they are now increasingly relying on social media as their primary source of news and information, it is a resource that is also bringing them great concern, great frustration, and you could even argue, right, uh, in some cases, a detriment to their own mental health and well-being. And so how do we begin to help them sort of navigate that tension between a resource that they rely on and yet one that can also undermine uh, their sense of well-being and, and efforts to uh, better master uh, their own ability to understand issues around racial justice? So let me end with just um, a, a, a three tips uh, for parents and educators as we begin to sort of uh, look forward and project forward in terms of how do we create a culture, how do we create a society, a world in which we help prepare young people uh, to deal with the challenges uh, that social media uh, brings. So I mentioned earlier, right, this, um, this, this idea of social media influencers. If you go to Instagram, if you go to TikTok, if you go to, uh, to Twitter, if you go to YouTube, uh, there is this emergence of a whole generation of what I would call micro celebrities or influencers, that is people who have derived an enormous sense of credibility, an enormous sense of, of visibility uh, and authenticity uh, based on their sort of savvy uh, negotiation, adoption, and use of social media. So if you think about um, a movement like Black Lives Matter, have hashtag Black Lives Matter uh, here on TikTok, for instance, or even on Instagram, what you're seeing, right, are, are sort of a new generation of spokespersons, a new generation of thought leaders uh, who are beginning to help inform and help your children develop sort of a vocabulary, a perspective, a, a worldview uh, that begins to equip them with the, with the materials that they need to better understand uh, these racial justice issues. So what can we do as, as parents? What can we do as educators? Uh, to the points that were raised earlier um, by Dr. Adams Bass, by Dr. Stevenson, it's just having uh, conversations um, and you know having conversations with young people about you know, who, who are they subscribing to via their social media channels. Um, you know who, what videos are they looking at? What YouTube channels are they following? Because this is really where influence is happening, and it's not so much to judge their decision to follow these people, to subscribe to these people, to view these people as influencers, but to simply understand right what is the connection right what is it um, that these influencers are saying or doing uh, that give them this kind of power uh, over uh, how young people might begin to define and understand social justice issues. 
another sort of really important uh, issue related to social media is, is how can educators and parents begin to facilitate a conversation uh, with, with children or their students um, around the ways in which social media is engineered, right, to, to filter certain kinds of information to us, right? This idea, right, that they're driven by these predictive algorithms, right, that are, that are based on things that you've watched, things that you've posted, things that you've shared, and then based on that kind of activity, then making recommendations about other things that you might be interested in, uh, filling your feed up with other kinds of content uh, that are similar to that. And what we've come to understand, right, no matter if it's talking about racism or Black Lives Matter or anything, uh, is that these algorithms oftentimes create these sort of, um, again, this bubble where young people are only exposed maybe to certain perspectives or certain positions. Um, and what we know, right, is that, is that social media platforms also tend to prioritize information that, that, that is either shared uh, very frequently, uh, liked a lot, um, retweeted, uh, reposted, um, generates comments on, on Instagram or, or, or likes on TikTok. Um, and so oftentimes this information is inflammatory. It can be uh, polarizing. Uh, you know, maybe you've heard the term clickbait. And so basically, how do we help equip our young people with the, the tools and the skills to understand that what they're seeing via their social media channels is oftentimes engineered by algorithms. And so uh, just building up right, uh, more of a protective kind of mechanism to help them to be able to discern and understand what they're being exposed to. Um, and then finally, um, what I would refer to here as um, uh, information literacy and how we might be able to support information literacy. What it means to be information literate today in 2020 is very different than what it meant to be information literate in say 2000, 1990, 1980, and so forth. Um, we know that, that, that our children live in a world in which there's not a lack of information, but in fact, an abundance of information. And so the question becomes, how do we help them to develop the skills, the competency, um, to be able to discern, to be able to uh, evaluate that information, to separate fact from opinion, to, to separate uh, research expertise uh, from an ideologically uh, biased uh, piece of content. Um, you know, deep fake videos or uh, fake news. Um, you know, again, information that's designed primarily to, to misinform, to polarize, uh, and to cause uh, friction. Uh, and so, um, both as it relates to, to the social media filter bubble, but also as it relates to information literacy, if I'm a parent, right, I'm trying to have conversations with, 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 with my uh, children's teacher, a principal, uh, others who are in charge of curriculum, and asking, right, uh, what are schools doing? to help young people develop the, the kinds of skills and capacity to better navigate, navigate and understand this world in which kids are now deeply immersed in. And I would argue, right, that having this conversation with kids can start extremely early, right? I would say as early as four, five, six, seven years of age, precisely because we know that kids have access to this content, they have access to devices, they're being exposed to algorithms, they're being exposed to artificial intelligence, they're being exposed to social media at younger and younger ages. So the sooner we begin to start equipping them right, with the literacy skills to navigate this world, uh, the better off they're likely to be, uh, the better off they're likely to be able to sort of develop a greater uh, confidence and competence as they engage issues around social justice. Um, I think um, as Dominic mentioned, um, you know, just a couple of books where I talk about young people and their relationship to technology. Um, uh, these are two recent books. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is for media innovation, um, a research institute that I've helped to build uh, and where we're looking at a lot of these issues through various uh, research uh, projects. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am overwhelmed by that. <laughs> and I don't have a kid. I could only imagine, and so much of what you evoke, Dr. Watkins, in, in, in thinking about how engineered information is and what now a parent's responsibility is. Um, and I don't think there's a, a easy sort of how to go about doing that. A question that quickly emerged for me um, was just the one of, so at what age do you think um, developmentally uh, kids can get in there with social with social media. What is the research sort of telling us? I think that's a big piece. Parents could be listening to this and thinking, you know what? You just don't get a phone. And that's not the answer because the internet is, is everywhere. Um, I imagine too that uh, Dr. Adams-Bass might have a, a thought on that 
Um, but I'll let you get in there first, um, Dr. Watkins, in responding, and then um, Dr. Adams Bass, and then we're going to turn to um, some folks who got some questions for us. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, and I would say, right, as, as soon as your kids, and, and we know that, again, the kids are being exposed to these devices, to, to these kinds of types of platforms at early and earlier ages. So if your kid is talking to a digital assistant, talking to Siri, talking to Alexis, if your kid has access to a smartphone, whether they own it or whether they use yours very frequently, I would say that, right, you can begin to start having uh, very gradual conversations about how they're interacting with that device, what that device means to them, what kind of trust and relationship they're developing to that device, uh, and just helping them to sort of develop a kind of critical awareness and vocabulary that as they grow up using those devices, they're always sort of being able to question and be critical of the ways in which those devices are supplying them with content and information. Got it, got it. That, that makes sense. And, and, and part of what you're saying is like, as the exposure increases, the conversations need to increase. And what I appreciate in that response is that that exposure isn't just about like the smartphone, which some parents might be thinking about because that's a primary source for social media. But, but you're saying that exposure is to like any of these devices where information and algorithms in the UK could be interacting with. Absolutely. Dr. Adams Bass, you, um, you, you pinged me and I wanted to, to check in if you wanted to, to add before we start to shift a bit to um, some broader questions that came in. Yes, thank you, Dominic. I just wanted to add to what Dr. Watkins has said, who was really projecting this change in media a while ago um, in terms of his work and his research. So he's dead on and we're, we're, where he had projected us to be. I would like to add that really to th think of it as racial media literacy. Right. So not just media literacy and understanding how to navigate and, and check fact check and make sure that the information you, you that your children are receiving is actual factual and based and and not fictitious media, but that they're learning to navigate those racialized messages, whether they're black children or non black children, because, as he mentioned, lots of that media is a form of instigating and bifurcating relationships among people. Um, and what was mentioned earlier is sort of developmentally, we know that adolescents lessons are going through an identity period. In media is incredibly influential at this moment in time where they're developing these virtual identities in space, which are in some ways as influencers. Um, there's, there's a monetary incentive often that comes with influencers that we haven't even begun to talk about. So this idea of not just navigating what they're exposed to, but the messages that they themselves are communicating around their racial identity and racial ideology. So it is the parents' and teachers' responsibilities to be thoughtful about the content that comes into our house, following them in these social media accounts, the books and the curriculum that's part of our conversation and our knowledge base so that we can help those young people as they're exploring their identities uh, understand the implications of what they're putting in these spaces and what they're responding to. So I think that's important. It's a racial media literacy that we need to be equipped with as adults, but also to equip our young people to understand, which certainly goes back to this idea of the racial socialization that we are communicating at this point in time where they are transitioning to adults and this social media is relying on them as a marketing tool. That's that's huge and, and really in, important. And I, I appreciate you intersecting, you know, the very two key ideas, I mean, from, from the talk that you gave, but also bridging with Dr. Watkins has, has shared. Folks, I'm going to try to just summarize and hit high level on some of the concepts that we've talked about, as I also invite Dr. Duje and Dr. Stevenson to come on screen um, as we move into a Q&A portion. Um, as folks have been sort of listening, we have covered racial socialization and media socialization and really talked about how you should be curating and thinking about what images your children are being exposed to and that is a really active role for you. We've also covered a bit around racial stress, um, really thinking about how do we talk to our kids about racism that they will experience, prepare them for that conversation and that one's ability to navigate racial stress will actually help one, um, help kids, help uh, kids of color, right? And then we moved a little bit into the intersection of like a kid's health and navigating race and racism and what is the role of parents um, and all parents um, to be able to prepare students, prepare kids rather for, for that. 
And we rounded out the conversation in like social media, right? And all of the ways in which um, social media is interacting and interfacing with you with your kids. And that was a place at which I got the most overwhelmed. I'm like, I don't want to touch a Facebook or Instagram or anything else at this point, knowing all the things it's doing. Yet that's exactly where our, our kids are at. Um, I'm hopeful that you are seeing the convergence in the intersection of a lot of what our panelists have already shared. I only wanted to touch high level um, so that you could hear it in, in one spot. With that, we will move into uh, questions and we have a few folks who have um, opted wonderfully to share them on screen. Um, so I'll ask Jeannie if you can come on and introduce yourself and share your question with our panelists. Can you hear me? Sure can, welcome. Hello, okay, so my name is Jeannie Dawkins and I'm a parent and um, a parent coach. And I have a question about how do you talk to your child about the difference between racism and bias? And my son is eight years old and of course he watches a lot of social media. So he is getting them confused and he's very um, animated about how people are racist against him. And to be honest, the lines are really blurry for me myself. So, you know, so how can I talk to him about that? Yeah, and I, what I might add, because I think is important, and there are other, these are some other terms too, right? It's when we throw in prejudice and discrimination. Um, and this is about giving kids the language um, that they need to discern um, and speak accurately um, sort of about their experiences. I have someone sort of in mind who can start us off, but I'm, I want to check to see if any one of our panelists want to hop right in. All right. Uh, yeah, just, Go I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the ways in which I guess I would approach having a conversation with, with, a, with a, a young child about this is, I mean, recognizing, right, that we, that we all have bias, right, that humans by, by our very nature uh, develop biases. Um, and, but that's very different from, you know, discrimination or racism. You know, we, we might think of racism, right, as um, something that's beyond sort of individual personal taste or, or inclinations. And racism, right, is, is sort of a reflection of how institutions allocate uh, resources, how institutions uh, in some ways create uh, these sort of stratified, stratified uh, societies where we see some people occupying higher levels of resources and opportunities and, and mobility versus others who find themselves operating sort of lower um, rungs of access to resources and opportunities. So bias is something that we, that we, that we all have. Um, and, and so it's important to recognize our biases, important to work against um, our biases, sort of, sort of influencing how we treat people, how we interact with people. But racism, right, as, we, as we're learning more and more in these conversations today are, are more about you know, systematic processes, about institutions, and about the ways in which our, re, our organizations and institutions allocate uh, resources along the lines of race, uh, and, and of course, other indicators as well. Okay. So that's deep. He's nine. He's nine. So, so for me, uh, what I said to him was racism is based on hate and it's an individual thing. And that some people, it may look like they're being racist, but they're not. They just have a bias. And they, that's what they know. They don't know any difference. And that he needs to vocalize that, that, that just because. So for him, it's whenever he plays a game, they always give him the black piece. And he goes to a school that is predominantly white. And he says to me that they're giving me the black piece because I'm black. They're calling me to the table last because I'm black. That is racist. And I'm telling him it's not racist because maybe they don't know that what they're doing could fall into that kind of thing. I told him it's like more of a bias. They don't understand. And that he needed to explain to them just because he's black doesn't necessarily mean that he likes the black piece that he would prefer other colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what 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 your son's experiencing and what others um, are experiencing and, and acting out of is is being implicated in a world where the system is already in place and those and those preferences already sort of uh, mired sort of in right and that's uh, really hard to. Uh, hard to unpack, for a kid to unpack, right, in that association, right? 
And, and I think um, a powerful response for a kid is to ask another kid, so why did you give me the black piece? Mm -hmm. Right? So one of the things that I think is super disarming from the folks who experience this into the folks who perpetuate it is the question that gets under, right? So I don't have to explain this for you, but like, I don't prefer the black piece, but I would like to know, why did you give it to me? And in whatever language that an eight-year-old or nine-year-old would use to ask that question to their friends, because that's a part of exploring it, even at that at that age. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that, and also that um, maybe some of his feelings are related to the intentionality of those actions. And so, what uh, Dominic just said around asking helps him to get a sense and know for himself uh, why that person did it. And there's a lot of research also around racism versus discrimination and prejudice, but our perceptions of a moment is a little bit different. If I perceive something to be offensive or, or dangerous or um, cruel, uh, that still affects my, my behavior, my focus, my learning in the process. So the best way is exactly what Dominic is saying. If he can ask it, and that takes courage in of itself, how do I practice? Maybe I have to practice doing it because I might be afraid of the answer, he's going to build a, a sort of strength for future moments. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. We're going to uh, move to the next question, but thanks for coming on and asking. Next up, we're going to uh, bring Allison up. Hi. Hey, Allison. Hi. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm an educator and parent of, I'm a 12 year old girl in Oakland, California. I'm hoping you could speak to the complexities of supporting a black and mixed kiddo to know their place inside the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, so I'd like to take that down. Go for it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm a biracial woman myself. I identify as African American, but I'm biracial. Mm -hmm. And so my children also identify as multiracial, um, multicultural. And I think first and foremost, I think it's I, I applaud you for asking the question and, and really working to try to help her with her identity. Um, and I think for the, for the most part, I always recommend celebrating both sides, right? Who she is, right? Because I think identity also is a developmental process and, and, other, provide, and other panelists might can maybe address this even more as well. Mm -hmm. So most people probably come into their, their sense of who they are, whether it's sexual, racial, gender identity, much later, right, how they're going to decide what they, who they identify with, right? but as they're growing up, you can provide them a sense of um, affirmation of, of both sides of their culture and exploring that um, and being willing to open to questions that they may have about what Black Lives Matter means, what it means to you, what it means to them. Um, so I really applaud you to continue those conversations and find as much as possible to affirm affirm her identities and even talk to her about how she identifies, right? And support her in that um, and, and who, who she is. Yeah. Thank you. My ad would be if there are currently prominent voices in the Black Lives Matter movement that are mixed race folk, um, yeah. that posing to those voices so that you can get a sense of what can this look like? Like, if I'm going to participate at this level, if I'm going to involve myself at this level, like that might be 20 years down the road for me, but I can have a vision of how other mixed race folks are navigating uh, the space where uh, how you phenotypically show up um, has something to do with how you might be able to contribute. And that becomes a very hard space um, for folks who are, are mixed race and might have a phenotypic expression that can be read in one way or the other, just hearing and seeing the voices of others who are doing it in the movement, who are committed, but, but also are navigating that space would be helpful. And I just wanna follow up real quick, Dominic. I think for, for many um, kids who have a mixed identity, mixed cultural, mixed racial identity, also how they look phenotypically is important, right? How they, how, other people perceive them as well as they, how they perceive themselves, I think is very important. So I think it's important to engage in those conversations. How does she feel about herself or he feel about himself based on hair, skin complexion, right? How they, how they come into the world and present to the world. And then also, I think it's important for them to understand that um, 
And I think it's also important when there's a parent of a different racial identity, right? So if your child identifies, for example, as African-American and you're a non-African-American parent, I think it's also important that we do the work to understand how they're, how they're going to be um, brought up, how people are going to perceive them um, and, and, and receive them in the world. So, the, and again, those, those, that racial socialization um, strategy that Dr. Adams Bass um, you know, eloquently said, right, and, and has the evidence for, I think is also important as well. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna be feelings. I mean, kids, mm -hmm. yeah, there's colorism, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to unpack, but I think as parents we have to also do that work to understand what that what that history is and how it might present for our kids. Yeah, or impact them. Thanks, Allison. We're gonna try to get to two more folks before we have to wrap up. I'll invite uh, Lydia. Hi, everyone. Hey, welcome. Thank you so much. This is a, a amazing panel. Um, and discussion. I'm a parent and educator myself. I live in the Netherlands and I am also a mom to four mixed race children. And um, we are also sort of global nomads. So we live in different countries and are currently situated in the Netherlands. And I'm really concerned about, uh, following on Alison's uh, question, I'm concerned about how much knowledge is really too much knowledge for children of mixed race um, culture given that they do tend to um, sit on the fence and move from one end to the other. So I want to be able to provide a larger picture, but I'm really interested in the research around how much of uh, knowledge about race is essential for their identity and for them to find their place in the world, especially if they are um, sort of uh, living in a, in a sort of global, um, society, I guess. Thank you. Um, I could throw in a, a thought. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Lydia. Um, one way to think about talking to children about race or anything is that, that if they have more knowledge, they will be able to manage the world in a particular way. Another way, though, is thinking about what children do with that knowledge or what children feel about that knowledge. And in many respects, I, I would argue it's, it's how they emotionally translate that knowledge that's functional for them on a day-to-day basis, whether it's with a conversation, whether it's with play groups, wherever the context. So I think a, a bigger issue is how will they use the information in what part of their lives to help them feel secure about who they are. And so I would say that, that, that it's, not a, it's not really about how much knowledge, but how how much do you, are you aware that they find it functional for them to navigate the world? And so um, in many respects, we're more interested in how kids can actually manage their stress about the knowledge or manage their stress about being different and then not allowing other sort of confusions or hostilities to seep into how they define themselves. They'll have strategies for uh, acknowledging that 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 really isn't about me. That's about you thinking about me. And I don't have to swallow that Kool-Aid if that makes any sense. So, um, and some parents are a little worried that, you know, if I talk too much about this, will they start feeling bad? And I think it's really, again, we do talk to children all the time and that around scary information that they manage quite fine. Like uh, some parents say, I tell my children not to talk to strangers or not take candy from strangers. And I was talking to a group of fifth graders once and say, do your parents ever say anything scary? They say, yeah, don't talk to strangers, don't take candy. Uh, and I said, well, have any strangers ever come up to you to give you candy? He said, no, uh, but we're real prepared for it, right? So <laughs> the idea is um, it's what they do with it that's more important than the actual content. And I think um, children can be, the question is how prepared do you want them to be when other people think of their difference as a problem? Thank you. I think the challenge is just that um, um, preserving that innocence and at the same time allowing them to explore the space in which they can educate themselves and their peers. Sorry, Valerie, go ahead. No, Lydia, thank you and welcome for joining us across the pond. <laughs> add um, a, a slightly or add on to that perspective, we spent a lot of time sort of coming back to this idea of racial socialization, which to me 
is so important. But I also want to talk about racial and ethnic identity, which has a cultural context. And so if you are sharing with your children, biracial or not, um, cultural and ethnic elements of their, of their history, their lineage, lineage, their space, um, that can contribute to how they are navigating the racialized encounters or racism that they experience, whether it's the nine-year-old always being given the black piece or a conversation about being biracial. So if you're sharing with them their cultural identities, uh, when they are confronted with sort of negative perceptions of self, they also have something to pull on in addition to responding to that negative information. And I think about my daughter um, teaching her about Harriet Tubman and then going to uh, going past the stop on the Underground Railroad. And when I pointed it out to her, she took off running at three years old and said, that's Harriet Tubman's house. So, you know, at a later point in time, we'll be able to come back to that conversation if Harriet Tubman is absent from the conversation about the history of Black people in America and contextualize that. So I think we also want to not just lean on, I hear the anxiety around, you know, how do we, you know, talk about racism without scaring our children, but we also want to celebrate the cultural context so that when we have those racial conversations or we're teaching them to navigate these spaces and how people respond to them, they have a rich history um, from both sides of the family to pull on. So that's just as important as preparing them to navigate and push back on people's negative perceptions and media's negative representations of who they are. So I want to encourage you to do that as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lydia. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Last up will be Jenna. I invite you to join us on screen and ask your question. Hi. You're welcome. Thanks for taking my question. My name is Jana Kim, and I'm a parent and an educator in Southern California. And I would love to hear the panelists' suggestions about how we as parents can help our public elementary and middle schools sort of more deliberately engage in anti-racist efforts, policies, professional development, things like that. And I specify K through eight specifically because I think we heard from Dr. Duje's talk that we can't wait until high school to address these bias issues. Um, the earlier, the better. Yeah, I have loads of thoughts and I'm in the middle of it as the director of diversity, equity and inclusion, bringing my team along regarding what a curriculum could look like and, and why. I think a framing for our panelists would, would be, so why? Like, why would we move in this way uh, when we haven't before? Um, and I think we have sort of information in social media. I think we know about media socialization, like what kids are, you know, going through in terms of racial stress. Uh, how do we bolster that message to schools that this is happening, therefore we must sort of a, a approach it? So, oh, where Dr. Stevens it? Um, well, I, I was thinking in, in, in our interviews of young people, uh, black and brown uh, students um, in those age, in those grade groups, um, in predominantly white settings in particular, many of them said, um, they understood sometimes when students in their classrooms would actually say things that were offensive and, and, and partially because they spent time with those folks, they knew their quirks and they could, they could attribute that what they were saying wasn't necessarily malicious. It was still bothersome, but maybe not malicious. But what they often said was, um, it really, really bothered us when the teachers didn't do anything about it. And so there was a sense of, of, of uh, expectation that my teachers will protect this particular learning space. And that could be on the, on the sports team, it could be on the playground, it could be in the classroom. And so uh, one argument for why teachers need to be thinking about this is, is, as I mentioned in my part, that many educators see these moments, but they're overwhelmed and unsure as to what to do. So one, one answer to that argument is, um, can teachers be prepared to navigate and create safe space, safer spaces for students of color or who are different so that they can feel protected, affirmed, uh, and, the, and the, everybody can be held accountable? Oh, and um, thank you, Dr. Singh. That was, that, that was great. And thank you for your question, Jana. I would say from a parent perspective, I think it goes back to, I guess, one of my slides, right? How do we 
help our kids really show up and be activists, right, in a sense, right, to kind of take some, take some ownership for what's going on um, and, and, and be actionable. So again, I think locally where I live, there are students that formed an end racism group, right? So these are, these are young people and supporting young people in this activism, right? Constructive activism to, to make changes. Um, also, I would say if you can, if, if there are issues in school, you need to talk to the principal, you need to talk to the school administrators. If you don't um, hear from your school administrators, go to the Board of Education, right, and keep pressing for the changes. And hopefully, um, your school system might even be willing to form an equity and inclusion committee, right? Or if they're not, you need to, you need to really um, lobby for that, right? Because those changes need to be made and helping the school system make that difference. But I know sometimes it's difficult for some parents to do that, but if, as, as a collective group, either supporting our children in the activism in terms of writing letters, speaking up in front of the Board of Education, or even sending letters, I think those are some things we can do as well. Cool. Uh, I, I think those are all great, great points. And, and Jenna, also thank you for your question. You know, something that Drs. Duje, Adams, Bass, and uh, Stevenson uh, mentioned during their presentations, uh, they talk a lot about the, the home environment kind of as a, as a literacy environment. So the kinds of books, uh, the kinds of media, the kinds of posters, uh, art uh, that are in the home, um, all of those things send um, subtle and not so subtle messages uh, around race and diversity. Um, you know, one of the things that I would do as, as, as parents or as, as parent groups uh, is to advocate for our, our educators, our classrooms, our instructors to also create uh, classrooms that are also multicultural in terms of uh, the literacy uh, sort of environmental conditions. Um, and I think it's important that, um, so one of the things that we do at the, at the higher education level is, you know, we have ongoing conversations with faculty about the kinds of readings that we are assigning in our courses and our syllabi. So maybe something that parents can do with, with their local school districts and with schools and with superintendents is begin to um, sort of advocate for more diverse kinds of perspectives and reading content materials being incorporated into the classroom. And that's one way of exposing kids, right, to different views, different stories, different perspectives in a way that can begin to sort of cultivate uh, the sensitivity uh, to the need to think in more nuanced ways around race, diversity, and difference. One last word from Dr. Adams Bass before Pam wraps us up. Sure. And again, Jenna, thank you for your question. I just want to, to piggyback on Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Duje and Dr. Watkins and say, why not change the curriculum? But more importantly, um, ask the students. You know, I think we've all heard, everyone has said that, that students are picking up on what teachers are or are not doing. They learn that as early as preschool. And so if there's some resistance from the faculty and administrators, why not ask the students? They're right there. They know what they are and aren't experiencing. And if you have students, as Dr. Watkins said, who have more diverse home environments, those students are, are, are going to be able to say very early at home, we have this book. We don't have these kind of books in the classroom. You know, and so I do think that asking the students and if there's no one on staff to sort of facilitate that conversation, you have a panel of experts here. There are people who do this work and help to facilitate it, but certainly asking the students as well as the parents, you know, what's at home, what's here, what's missing. And, and, you know, and my last part of that is I had a student who wanted to enroll in my class and she said, until she saw the movie Black Panther, she had no idea there was a Black Panther party. So that's why she wanted to take my class to learn about the historical legacy of Black Americans and Black history. So again, if it's missing, they're not going to get it and they may not get it until they're sitting in one of our classrooms. So ask those students as well as those parents and bring that to the teachers. I have no final words besides the thank you. And I recognize we're a couple minutes over. I just want to express gratitude to the, to the panel. Uh, and we probably could have gone for another hour and a half uh, we can't. And instead, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pam to wrap us up fully. Thank you all, folks. Really do appreciate it. Thank you all for coming and for participating in this really critically important discussion. And thank you, Dominic, Valerie, Howard, Craig, and Jacqueline for all of your time and expertise. Thank you also for sharing your stories and concrete information so that others can learn. We hope that the conversation today has encouraged you to think critically about this issue and to start or continue conversations with your kids about race, 
social justice and representation. To continue learning about this topic, be sure to visit our website where we will post additional insights in the coming days. We'll also be posting a YouTube video of today's workshop, which we encourage you to share with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and friends. For more uh, from Children's Screens, please follow us on social media at the account shown on your screen. Our discussions about digital media use and children's well-being will continue throughout the fall and winter with weekly Wednesday workshops. Next Wednesday, September 23rd at noon EDT, we will be discussing the latest research on video gaming. The conversation will cover everything from violent video game play to when and why you might want to pick up that remote and join in. It promises to be a lively and enlightening conversation. <clears throat> when you leave the workshop, you will see a link to a short survey. Please click on the link and let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Thanks again, and everyone be safe and well.